Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, as you know, in these last couple of days of session, it gets busy and lots of people are in lots of different meetings. Uh, the uh, meeting will come to order. The clerk will note the roll. There is a quorum. Uh, members, we have the uh, minutes of the last meeting, uh, May 13th, before us. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Representative Detmer moves approval of the minutes. Any questions, corrections, additions to the minutes? See none. All in favor of the minutes signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, members, we have uh, three items on our agenda this evening. A uh, change to the budget resolution, House File 622, and House and Senate File 1398. Um, I will take the first one, which is uh, the budget resolution. Um, and members, uh, what we're what I will do is uh, move the A31 amendment to the budget resolution, uh, which uh, increases the amount of money in the uh, capital investment target. Uh, members, uh, this is an amount of money sufficient to do a $100 million bonding bill. And uh, members, uh, you know, I, I guess I was actually thinking that there maybe wouldn't be a bonding bill this year, but as we've had other discussions uh, with the Senate and uh, with, the, um, with other uh, individuals, uh, we have felt that there are some things that should be done uh, Representative Torkelson, Chair Torkelson, uh, has a bill, House File 622, uh, which uh, contains uh, our latest list of things, although that may be subject to change as it moves forward. Uh, but members, I think that uh, while I would prefer to probably not have a bonding bill this year under the circumstances uh, with the items that we have, I think that it does make sense to... Um, to uh, move forward with this. And uh, just, I've got a technical issue that I've got to talk to Mr. Marks about. Just a moment. Okay, All right. okay. Uh, I think we're good. Yeah, we're, that's, 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 that's not, yeah. Um, so, Members, I guess uh, I know there's also a couple of uh, amendments that uh, we have here, and I guess I'd recognize uh, Representative Carlson to uh, move an amendment to the amendment. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the uh, First Amendment uh, I would like to move uh, is the A35 amendment. Okay, Representative Carlson moves the A35 amendment to the A31 amendment. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you'll recall when I talked about uh, a uh, bonding bill, capital investment bill. Um, in earlier meetings, I said I felt that there would be one in the end. Um, and uh, the last time I think I had a conversation about that was when you moved uh, 50 million from uh, the uh, bottom line into the uh, reserve. And so this amendment was based on uh, recapturing that uh, rich 50 million, if you will, that uh, you were putting into the reserve and adding that to the line dealing with uh, okay. capital uh, investment. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, what that would do, uh, and I'm kind of rounding the numbers, but uh, for uh, purposes of discussion, that would allow uh, an additional 500 million in bonding. Deal. Uh, to uh, your 100 million, or a total of roughly 600 million in bonding. So, um, I hope people were hearing me. I guess I didn't have the mic there. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, to move that amendment. Uh, that would give you, in my view, uh, more flexibility as the uh, bill that you have uh, moves forward. If it does, in fact, uh, move forward here tonight. Uh, I've got a feeling at the $100 million level, there's going to be a whole lot of discussion about uh, the uh, size of that bill and the uh, lack of important projects that uh, many people, and I have a strong feeling that it may be people on both sides of the aisle in the end when that hits the House floor, feel that uh, there should be uh, in a bonding bill this year. 
that's below what I talked about initially. Uh, I, if you recall, I referenced that we would hopefully have an $850 million bonding bill. So if this amendment goes on, when the bill hits the House floor, you could go somewhere between $100 million and $600 million and uh, fit within the uh, House budget resolution. So I move that amendment. Okay, Representative Carlson moves the A35 amendment, and I'm told there's a, a technical correction on the amendment on page 1, line 5, that it should be insert uh, 42, uh, 42 billion 891 million 111,000. Um, is that correct, Mr. Marks? Yes. That's correct. Are, are you we okay doing, with that? Mr. Chairman, we were doing this over the telephone, and so um, we ended up with um, an error in the number, but uh, with Mr. Mark's um, good diligence, uh, that uh, correction, uh, I'll inc incorporate that in uh, my amendment. All right. Uh, discussion to the A35 amendment to the amendment. Um, I guess, Representative Carlson, I would just say that, uh, you know, going from 100 million to 600 million is a big jump. I guess I, I kind of uh, uh, belong to the school of saying that we had a big bonding bill last year, and I still sort of believe that the odd numbered years should be reserved for the more emergency type items. Also, because, uh, you know, the Capital Investment Committee traditionally does a lot of tours in the summer and fall to look at the different projects so they can better evaluate them. And suddenly doing five or six hundred million dollars of bonding here would mean doing an awful lot of projects that maybe the Capital Investment Committee hasn't had a chance to see. And so I think that we should really give them the opportunity this summer and fall to do that due diligence so we can come back next year and make sure that we've vetted all the projects that would be in the bill. Yeah. Representative Carlson. Mr. Chairman, as I pointed out, uh, you know, we're, at, we're in the waning days of the session. And, uh, you know, it does take in the end 81 votes to pass a bonding bill. I indicated I was trying to give more flexibility. I would like to see a $600 million bonding bill in the end, or roughly that number. Um, but it certainly gives you more flexibility on the, uh, on the House floor. As I said earlier, somewhere between 100 and 600 million. Uh, but certainly, uh, there's going to be a whole lot of discussion of members on both sides of the aisle that are going to see needed projects that they would like to see included in the bonding bill. And uh, we won't have that uh, opportunity probably to meet as a committee again. So they would fit as the bonding bill might be written or expanded to some level on the House floor when you move it out. So, uh, by the way, I would like a roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, there will be a roll call vote on the A35 amendment to the amendment. Uh, any other discussion to the amendment to the amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the A35 amendment to the amendment. Not Black? No. Albright? No. Anderson? Carlson? Aye. Cornish? Davids? No. Dean? No. Detmer? No. Draskowski? No. Garofalo? No. Gunther? No. Hackbarth? No. Hamilton? No. Hillstrom? Yes. Hornstein? Kahn? Lincheski? Yes. Liebling? Yes. Loon? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. McNamara? Murphy? Yes. Nornis? Pulowski? Yes. Poppy? Yes. Turkelson? No. Erdahl? No. Wagenius? Yes. Uh, there be nine ayes and 12 nays. The amendment to the amendment is not adopted. <coughs> Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I uh, had the first one passed. I wouldn't be moving this one, but I do have a uh, more uh, modest uh, amendment. Uh, you left uh, with uh, your amendment. There would be 4,703. Thousand left on the uh, bottom line, and I would move that four million seven hundred and three million up to uh, the capital investment line with amendment number um, 
30 is it 36 I think yeah amendment uh, yes a 36 so I would move the a 36 amendment ask for a roll call vote and um, this would basically uh, increase uh, the opportunity for a slightly larger bonding bill to give you a little bit more room uh, probably a bonding bill in the neighborhood of 150 million all right representative on Carl's top, or not on but including your 100 and so we'd go to about 150 Representative Carlson moves the A36 amendment. Uh, discussion, Representative Detmer. Is there an error on uh, line 1.3 also? Uh, Mr. Marks, is there a... We, we double checked that. I don't think that when we discovered the first one, I think this one was okay, but we'll rely on Mr. Marks. Uh, it's moving 4.7 million. I think that's the right number. Okay, okay. okay. sounds like it's okay. Uh, well, uh, discussion to the A36 amendment to the amendment. <coughs> I guess, uh, you know, Representative Carlson, I appreciate you being more flexible and uh, coming down on this, uh, but I guess still for some of the same reasons I said earlier that I, I guess I would oppose the amendment. Uh, you know, I do, you know, would encourage uh, uh, you to talk to the bonding chair, and I know that you and I had talked about that earlier today already to make sure that you had a opportunity to have your caucus uh, bring forward projects uh, that uh, you feel are important uh, for some consideration. And uh, this uh, bill, as it is before, going to be before us, may, may change in the coming day or two also. Uh, but uh, for the reasons I said before on the other amendment, I guess I'd ask members to oppose the A36 amendment to the amendment. Representative Carlson. Mr. Chair, uh, when you say it, it could change in the next day or two, that was the point of my first amendment and this one as well. The clock is running. I think we're down to 50 hours, maybe 60, somewhere in that range. Uh, some of our folks have it on their cell phone. I don't. <laughs> uh, how many hours remain? And um, so if this amendment does go on, it gives you some flexibility as the bonding bill uh, is discussed. And it's a relatively modest amount. The amount is sitting there on the bottom line. Um, so um, uh, when you talked about uh, input, um, it's my understanding that uh, Art Caucus um, was given a list, I've got it here, <coughs> of the bonding projects which you're going to be acting on in a few minutes of 100 million. So there wasn't any room when we got that list, you're spending the full 100. Well, what, so what was, I guess I meant, Representative truly, Carlson, is... There truly wasn't an opportunity in that regard, uh, as I understand it. Uh, uh, to the credit of the bonding uh, committee chair, he did share with uh, one of our, uh, well, our lead on um, capital investment. But uh, it's a list right here that uh, totals the uh, entire amount of uh, the 100. And I guess I what I so meant when I... we were asked to endorse what you had already prepared, I guess, is the way I would put it. Uh, well, we'll have a chance to have uh, Chair Torkels and talk about it. But what I meant when I said that statement is that, you know, there may well be projects that after further discussion, people decide maybe shouldn't be in here and perhaps other projects should be substituted. And so as uh, the bill goes forward in the next day or two, uh, you know, we'll have an opportunity to to have those discussions. Mr. Chairman, the list that I have, and you probably have the same list, totals 98747000 so there wasn't a lot of room for suggestions. Well, Representative Carlson, I meant the sense of suggestions where perhaps you'd suggest that you felt a project that was on the list was not meritorious and that there was another project that was a, a better project. But um, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to have those discussions I, when I the bill comes forward. I think this is the direction, Mr. Chairman, to go rather than my sitting here and knocking out uh, projects that um, we might recommend that aren't favorable from our perspective would probably be a lot. Knowing the sensitivity of capital investment bills, and I've carried many, and you did, uh, back I carried them when we had the Appropriations Committee before we had capital investment, and I carried several. Um, and it's always problematic when you're, uh, once you have a list that's out there to knock um, <coughs> somebody's project or some community's project off the list. It's much better and much easier to add one, and there's a modest number there, 50, roughly 50 million additional dollars. 
Well, thank you, Representative Carlson. I guess I, I remain unconvinced. Um, clerk will take the roll on the A36 amendment to the amendment. Not block. No. Albright. No. Anderson. Carlson. Aye. Cornish. Davids. No. Dean. No. Depper. No. Jaskowski. No. Garofalo. No. Gunther. No. Hackbarth. No. Hamilton. No. Hillstrom. Aye. Hornstein. Kahn. Vincheski. Liebling. Yes. Loon. Mahoney. Yes. McNamara. Murphy. Yes. Nornis. Pulowski. Yes. Poppy. Yes. Turkelson. No. Erdahl. No. Wagenius. Yes. Uh, there being uh, nine ayes and 12 nays, the A36 amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman, I was just hopeful that you'd, now that we're about to conclude the session, that you'd give us at least one amendment. You know, I, well. Over the, over the past five months, but that be it as it is. Thank you. Well, thanks, Rep. Thanks, Representative Carlson. Well, members, we have the uh, A31 amendment before us. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the uh, A31 budget resolution amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Motion prevails. The A31 amendment is adopted. Okay, members, uh, the next item of business is uh, Representative Torkelson and House File 622. Uh, Chair Torkelson moves that House File 622 be referred to the General Register. And members, we have a DE1 amendment that uh, is a delete all amendment that really encompasses uh, the uh, full proposal. And so I guess I would ask that members would uh, go along with uh, putting that on to House File 622 so the bill can get into the shape the author desires. Chair Torkelson moves the DE1 amendment. All in favor of the DE1 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Most prevails the DE1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Chair Torkelson, uh, could you uh, basically briefly walk us through the DE1 amendment or House File 622 as it is now amended? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the DE1 amendment, uh, which is now part of the bill, outlines a number of capital investment projects. <laughs> Um, totaling nearly $100 million. I'll just briefly step through the uh, projects uh, off of the spreadsheet. Um, first, we have the uh, University of Minnesota project, the Wilmer Poultry Testing Laboratory, uh, for $8.529 million. Uh, this project would be one of one uh, important project to address the ongoing issue of avian influenza. Next, we have the Department of Natural Resources, the uh, first project, a flood hazard mitigation project in Ottertail County to address uh, some high lake levels there that are causing serious flood damage to residents around uh, some of the small lakes in Ottertail County. Uh, next uh, two projects are part of the disaster bill uh, that is being carried by Representative Albright a portion of that is bondable, and these next two projects are part of that effort to address uh, disaster relief, uh, flood hazard mitigation, and DNR facility and natural resource damage repair, 2.515 million and 2.14 million. Uh, the rim conservation easements under the Board of Water and Soil Resources is also part of that disaster relief bill that. Uh, is being carried by Representative Albright. Uh, the next item, item on line 16 under the Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, deals with a flood, ongoing flood mitigation projects in the Minnesota River Basin, specifically Area 2. 
Uh, under administration, we have two lines for the state capital restoration project. The first uh, line item, security items, for $6.2 million uh, is enough money to cover security items that have been outlined but not yet approved by the Capital Preservation Committee. Uh, that's why we put them on a separate line. Uh, there is some discussion going on in the committee about just what, which of those, how those items might proceed and they have yet to make official approval of those items. That's why we put that on a separate line. Next we have the out of scope <laughs> items uh, in the capital restoration project. The bulk of that being the, uh, the space underneath the plaza and the repair work on the plaza and steps leading up to the capital for $24.724 million. Uh, next under the Department of Transportation we have local road program for $10.9 million and the local bridge program for $9.25 million general obligation bonds from the trunk highway fund. Uh, next, the Minnesota Valley Regional Railroad Authority, $1 million, another ongoing project uh, that needs money to keep it moving forward. Next, under the Department of Corrections, we have the Northeast Regional Correction Center in St. Louis County. Um, it's a uh, detention center that does train uh, the inmates there to uh, process meat. Uh, the training side has been addressed in the, I believe, in the Ag Bill. Uh, this addresses needs for the facilities there that uh, no longer meet uh, or are close to falling short of meeting health department requirements. Uh, finally, on the page, we have the Public Facilities Authority Wastewater Infrastructure Fund for $16.489 million. Uh, Mr. Chair, that is about it, except for the uh, hundred thousand dollars the Minnesota management and budget fees or costs to issue uh, the bonds uh, also included in the bill are a number of corrections in the language in the bill most of uh, all of them to allow to past years bonding projects uh, I believe there I won't read through them all but I believe there are corrections to eight or ten uh, different projects, most of it uh, being language changes, uh, language mistakes that were made in past bills. Uh, for instance, a street being named, get the wrong street being named in the bill, we have to get the right street in there. Uh, bond council is pretty fussy about the language in a bonding bill and the words all need to be correct and there's a number of corrections here to uh, get these projects, the language for the projects and the shape they need to be in so the projects can move forward. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Torkelson. And I guess the members, I should tell you that there is a spreadsheet of the uh, financial items that's in the bill that is in your packets. And uh, I think maybe before we uh, have you stand for questions, uh, Chair Torkelson, I'll also uh, entertain the A1 amendment um, to the Delete Everything Amendment, which is now House File 622 as amended. Uh, Representative Albright moves the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative Albright, can you speak to the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, these are uh, additional items that uh, came out of the House File 748 that uh, should be included in the uh, bond uh, bill for this uh, session. And, they, and there is a separate spreadsheet, members, for the items that are in the uh, a1 amendment that uh, Representative Albright just referenced. Um, and uh, members, I guess just, I, I think everyone probably understands this, but uh, this is uh, a lot of the same items as uh, was just recently passed on the House floor earlier today. It's the um, flood relief bill that uh, we had before us uh, that since uh, we are now looking at having a bonding bill and a portion of it is bondable, uh, we felt that we would carry it in the bonding bill. There is language so that if, for example, somehow both of these bills were to become law, we wouldn't be double spending these. Uh, so with that, is there any discussion to the A1 amendment? Uh, Representative uh, Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would just um, wanted to know from from Chair Torkelson, if the bonding committee has been to see the projects that are before us. Um, so we have um, 
you know, for example, this uh, flood, flood hazard mitigation in Ottertail County, the Wilmer Poultry Testing Lab, um, any of the other items here. Has the committee gone to see these? Excuse projects? me, Representative Liebling, I'm wondering, we're on the A1 amendment right now, oh. and I'm wondering if we could uh, take questions on the A1 amendment, and that's certainly an appropriate question you have, but if we could wait for the discussion of the bill for that. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you. Well, maybe I could just start by asking that about what's on, on the A1, and I don't have the actual amendment, it's just the spreadsheet, correct? Oh, no, there is an amendment. There is an A1 ah, amendment. Thank yeah, you. I don't have the amendment either. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm sorry. I I have one. I thought it had been distributed. I'm, I'm very sorry. Sure, you should have one. <laughs> and I do. <laughs> all right. We're distributing the A1 amendment, members. Uh, well, Representative Liebling, do you want to uh, ask that question again in regard to the A1 amendment? Right. Well, Mr. Chair, I guess having just gotten this in my hand, I don't really even know where these things are and uh, and what they are. And, and maybe Representative Torkelson could um, just kind of walk through this and tell us if the if if you've been and if the committee's been to see these various various things that are on this amendment spreadsheet, if you would. Representative Liebling, are you asking? Uh, you also asked about information on the projects on this, and it's Representative Albright's oh. amendment. Okay. Are you, I guess, not to put words in your mouth, but are you, are you interested in getting information on the projects from Representative Albright, the author of the amendment, or did you have a question for Chair Tor Torkelson? Well, Mr. Chair, just from looking at the spreadsheet, and I suppose I can sit and read the amendment now that I have it, but looking at the spreadsheet, it doesn't tell me where these projects are. So I guess, but I guess I'd like to know at least where they are, but I'm really interested to know, since we've had some discussion about the fact that the bonding committee hasn't been able, won't be able to add, pro you, won't, you don't want to add projects because the committee hasn't had a chance to see them. And so I'm interested in knowing, first of all, where these are, but also whether the committee has had a chance to see them. All right, well, I think just, I guess, I think that the author of the amendment, Representative Albright, probably knows more about your question as to where they are. I suspect that Chair Torkelson knows more about your question regarding the committee. So uh, I guess, you, who do you want to ask first? Well, I guess we'd like to, I'd like to know where they are first, I guess, if Representative Albright. All right, Representative Albright, if you that. could uh, answer Representative Liebling's question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and to your question, Representative Liebling, the contents of the a1 amendment really are uh, a continuation of the House File 748 that we uh, presented to the membership on the uh, floor of the House uh, this afternoon. And so just to reiterate uh, the contents of that, uh, there are 36 counties as well as three uh, 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 reservations that are included in that. And from a standpoint of the vetting process that we went through, um, I hope that you will uh, except my uh, assurances that they have been vetted by not only the DNR, Bowser, but also by uh, Homeland Security uh, over the course of the last 11 months that these have been properly vetted, uh, properly uh, scrutinized to make sure that they fulfill both Chapter A and Chapter B, uh, 12A and Chapter 12B of, of the statutes to make sure that they're in compliance with the, uh, the authorship that uh, Representative Pulaski put forward a number of years ago. And Representative Liebling, if I could have a page come forward, um, we actually had this, um, you know, this bill before us in a different form here a few days ago, and one of the items they had uh, was this map of where all the projects are. And uh, okay. I guess Mr. Marks has a copy that I'll uh, have the page uh, bring over to you so you can maybe get a better sense statewide of where the projects are. Okay, and Mr. Chair, thank you, that's helpful. It's jogging my memory about this, and I think we did this, I think I kind of came in in the middle of that discussion. Okay. And I recall um, now that I did get to see the map. So, um, Representative Albright, that's all that's in this amendment to the amendment is, is those flood and um, disaster Mr. relief projects. Mr. Representative Chair. Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Liebling. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, Representative Wagenius, did you have a question? To the What's that? To the, bill. Oh, to the bill. Okay, question to the, to the amendment. Representative Carlson, I saw you raise your hand. Did you have a question to the amendment? 
Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, being that this was already passed in the form of House File 748, I'm trying to remember, was it was a Senate file substituted? Or did we substitute into a Senate file? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Representative Mr. Albright. Mr. Chair. My understanding that it was on its way to the governor's desk. Is that House Bill 748 was passed out. Uh, we did not accept the Senate language, which was 699, I believe. Okay, so, uh, so it's they not were on looking the way to, to the governor's desk. Uh, no, and the Senate file is not moving currently. I think it's still waiting for its second engrossment. Okay. Representative I was trying to figure out the status here. Sure. Um, where we were with the original uh, bill. Well, Mr. Chairman, it, Representative Carlson. Uh, these are all issues that have passed the House already. I, I find it rather interesting uh, because when we look at uh, the overall amendment, there's one, two, three, four items there that have passed the House already. So we're doing a lot of duplication here. Representative Mahoney, did you have a question on the A1 amendment? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, and if Representative Albright could just explain to me. I'm looking at the bill, uh, the A1 amendment. Um, so you've got local road and bridge reconstruction, the Historical Society, Natural Resources, uh, Board of Soil and Water, or Water and Soil, and economic development, correct? Representative Albright. Representative Mahoney, Mr. Chair, thank you. That is correct, Representative so, Mahoney. And Mr. Representative Chair, Mahoney. What's the total bonding that you're doing today? Because I'm looking at this spreadsheet and seeing $11 million at the bottom, and I'm totaling up the numbers, and Sister Vincent would probably say I'm, I, must, I should have paid better attention in arithmetic, but it looks like it's a little different. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Representative Mahoney. Uh, the, in, in some cases, um, uh, I don't believe that uh, the uh, bond proceed or the uh, uh, expenses are included in the A1 on the spreadsheet. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to quickly do the math in terms of consolidating some of the numbers here. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to get back to that yet during the meeting if you'd like. Mr. Chair, I, I understand that these have been vetted and we're going to move this forward. So it, I'll catch uh, up Representative with Mahoney. One of the I'll catch up with one of the finance people to figure it out oh. if there was something I'm missing. Uh, Representative Mahoney, I think I've got the answer to yep. you. Uh, do you otherwise, Representative Albright, do you have that? I'm told what it is is that uh, if you look at this, uh, some of it is general fund money and some of it is bond fund money. And so uh, the spreadsheet you see of $11 million only references the general fund money in the A1 amendment. Uh, the bond fund money was previously put into the other spreadsheet, and so uh, it's this. You're just trying to confuse this kid for me. It is well, Mr. I guess it is a little confusing. I will admit. I think we're observing that up, but Mr. the Chair. numbers are you know higher because it's got both the bond fund and the general fund in it. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Mahoney. There's 11 million dollars from the general fund but $800,000 uh, from the State Transportation Fund. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. $800,000 from the State Transportation Fund. So, Mr. Chair. Representative Mahoney. Uh, the A1 amendment, what's the total, uh, Representative Albright, uh, what's the total dollar figure in the A1 amendment? General fund, bond, and bond fund. That's all, all, I'm, that's all I'm trying to figure out. 11.8. 7.8? 11. 11.8. Um, a representative, or excuse me, Ms. Dyson, do you have a number for us? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Mahoney, you asked for the total dollar amount of the A1, A1 amendment, amendment all, all fund sources, right. correct? Okay. Um, quick arithmetic. <laughs> um, um, 20, it should be 
136. So it's 11 million plus 9.366 6 million plus 800,000. And he was asking for the bond amount, correct? For all funds. Okay, so I think there was some confusion about the question of whether it was just one of the funds or all three of the funds that are in the bill. But uh, you're saying, again, Ms. Dice, the total amount in the bill for all the three different funds is how much again? Uh, Mr. Chair, the total um, for the A1 amendment, which is the new Article 2 disaster relief, would be 22.136 million. Okay. Uh, Representative Carlson. I'm, I'm going by memory here, but then that would be the exact number that was in House File 748. That is correct. So I, I think it Representative should Carlson. be, Mr. Chair, clear then that we weren't just talking about the spreadsheet here of the 11 million. Right. When the uh, full amendment is before us, it was Thank literally uh, twice that. So we passed before we have Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, well, it was, this was the, I guess, this was the general fund items and the other capital budget spreadsheet you had, which had the capital items in it, already had the bonding funds. And so this is essentially replacing what was in it. But I, I understand the confusion, Representative yeah, well, Carlson. I can see how it would be confusing. Those are the ones that I referenced that I had marked uh, that there are four on the other list that uh, had already passed as well. Okay. So you have to take those four plus the 11 million on here and you should arrive at something pretty close to 22,136 mm -hmm. according to my mm -hmm. red pen map. Yeah. Okay. Other discussion to the A1 amendment? See no further discussion. All in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Okay, members, uh, we now have the bill before us. Discussion to House File 622 as amended. Uh, Representative Liebling, you had a question before, I think. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And back to my question for Representative Torkelson about these um, various projects and whether the committee has, has been to see them since that seems to be the linchpin of whether a project gets, gets to be considered this session. Chair Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the committee has not been on any uh, field trips or visits on, at this point. Uh, we have heard some of these issues in committee and had uh, descriptions of them by uh, experts in uh, with, uh, the various provisions um, you know I would your description as a linchpin is I would say a bit overstated but uh, certainly I do believe that there is value in uh, the capital investment committee touring uh, projects all around the state and that is something we do intend to do in the interim to prepare ourselves for next year's bonding bill so, Representative Liebling. So Mr. Chair and thank you Representative Torkelson and I also believe there's value in the committee going to see projects. I've never had the fortune of serving on that committee, but certainly colleagues who have have found it to be very valuable. But um, what then distinguishes these projects that makes you think that it's okay to go ahead and move these forward as opposed to all the many others that I'm sure are out there that um, members have been, have been bringing you surely that you felt that haven't um, been ready to move? The Chair Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've, uh, these projects were selected on the basis of urgency uh, and appropriateness for this bonding bill at this time, uh, either in the case, like in the case of the capital restoration project, uh, if that project is going to continue on schedule and finish on time at the estimated cost, it needs to move ahead now. Um, we, uh, our schedule get back in that building on a certain date, and if we don't get all the work done, we may have difficulty even moving in. Uh, other projects uh, based on their need uh, on an ongoing basis, if they have needs for funds in the near, near future to keep the project moving forward, we've tried to address some of those. In the case of the avian flu project, uh, the, the research center in Wilmer, uh, that is a current uh, uh, emergen uh, emergency, maybe is too strong a term, but it's certainly an uh, issue that uh, deserves uh, immediate attention, and that's why that one is on the bill. I could go through each project 
if you'd like to take the time, but uh, that in general is the way these, uh, this was approached and the reasoning behind the selection of the projects. And if I could just add to that, you know, I think other than the capital, which we uh, all uh, seem to be touring daily these days, uh, uh, a lot of the projects that are on here don't have a specific site to tour, but are a uh, ongoing sort of project that we've uh, had for many years, like the local uh, road and bridge program or the WIF program, various flood mitigation programs. And so those are, are more ongoing programs that we have. I know in past history, I think probably put money into in every bonding bill going back many years. And there's not a specific site to see, I think, in, in most of those project areas. Uh, but uh, Representative, we've got a few other people on the list. Representative Wagenius and then Representative Carlson. Uh, oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two, two different questions. One, on your Department of Transportation, your $21 uh, million, uh, how much of the road and bridge problem that we have does this solve? What percentage? Uh, Representative Thorkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not have a percentage figure for you, Ch uh, uh, Representative Wagenius. As you know, there is some discussion as to just how big the issue is. Uh, but uh, because this is aimed at local projects, uh, the idea behind this is that we keep those local contractors working so that we maintain that capacity uh, in our <coughs> local bridge and local road construction projects. Uh, if we have a if we skip a year, uh, those contractors tend to move on to other areas. Representative Wilginius? Well, it's hard to know what this means without context. And so we, you might have a high estimate that you believe is high and one that you believe is reasonable. So we should know the one you believe is reasonable. What percentage of the need does this solve? I, I think that's. Uh, We talk a lot about inputs, but we need to have context, so we need to know what kind of outcomes we're getting. And I'm kind of missing that on this. So maybe by the time we see you again, we will know what the meaning of this is, okay? All right, second question. Um, you have flood hazard mitigation in Ottertail County and uh, I, I remember hearing that in um, capital investment and surprised to see it here because I don't think there was a conclusion about why these particular lakes were rising. And so if we don't know, if we don't understand the problem, it feels premature to try to solve it. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since the presentation, we have consulted with uh, DNR. We DNR are the go-to experts on this, and they believe the project is valid and should proceed. Well, that didn't answer my question. My question was, do we understand why these particular lakes are rising when in a lot of the state that is not what's happening? Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I would defer to the DNR, who uh, believes that this project is valid and should move forward. Uh, I don't know if, honestly, don't know if anyone knows why the lakes are rising. It's because there, there's more water in them than there used to be, I guess. Well, sometimes if you try to solve a problem without understanding it, you may exacerbate it, and that's. Um, seems to me that DNR needs to understand this problem of why these, these this, just this small cluster of lakes in one part of a fairly sandy area are rising. It doesn't, it <coughs> never made common sense and we, I, we never did get an answer to that. So uh, just, just a question. Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, and I, well, I've got a couple of uh, comments, but uh, being that the uh, capital restoration was mentioned, and uh, I think the comment was something like, this money is needed so that we can move in. Um, it 
it's my understanding that uh, all or most of that 30 million is for exterior work, so that wouldn't prevent any thing on the interior moving in. Um, it's uh, 20 million, as I look at my iPad here, 20 million uh, for water infiltration settlement of the south stairs, 4.37 million uh, for out of scope items, and I'm not sure exactly what that out of scope means. They've got it here at 437, and on your sheet um, that was handed out, uh, it shows a much larger number for what they call out of scope. Maybe uh, the chair can explain what that means when we get when I get done here. But 6.2 million for capital security, 300,000 for bus loading and unloading. So um, the the point is that uh, virtually. Um, all or the vast majority of that is for exterior work. So there's not quite the emergency that I think was implied by we wouldn't be able to move in unless this was moving forward uh, currently. But um, the other question I have uh, was the amendment that uh, we have before us for the bill was, did that go, uh, Representative Torkelson, uh, before the Capital Investment Committee? This particular list and was it voted on in capital investment and uh, I'm just curious as to what kind of transparency there has been as this list of almost a hundred million is put together because our caucus uh, to the best of my knowledge had uh, no input it's my understanding that staff and Representative Torkelson gave our lead uh, a copy of this proposal today uh, mid-afternoon um, even though you said we could make suggestions and we talked about that earlier, but uh, obviously when you've got a hundred million and the list is complete, that's pretty hard to make any suggestions. So uh, this is one bill that requires 81 votes and it's vitally important as you and I both know that uh, uh, both sides of the aisle be involved and consulted and that there be projects that uh, are uh, balanced to some degree between the districts of the uh, of the two caucuses. I mean, that's the history of capital investment. That's why we have to make sure it's uh, uh, well balanced. And uh, so, if uh, Representative Torkelson could uh, comment then about what the history of uh, these projects are as it comes before us, and whether it was given any blessing in the Capital Investment Committee as it was as that list was finalized. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Carlson. First, uh, I'd sure like to thinking. backtrack to your original <laughs> question, which I think I can still remember, uh, dealt with the Capital Restoration Project. Approximately, I don't have my sheet in front of me delineating all those projects, but approximately 20 million of that project is to restore the space under the plaza which is space that is intended to be occupied. Uh, and so that uh, there was more damage in that area from water infiltration than was first, uh, than was originally suspected. So when they were able to open up those spaces, they found the additional water damage. And in order to make those spaces uh, occupiable, they needed to, I don't know if that's a word. Is that a word, Mr. Chair, occupiable? Well, I think we know what you mean. Okay. Uh, or <laughs> sorry about my English. Um, they needed that 20 million goes towards uh, working on the plaza, getting the water uh, issues straightened out, and then making those spaces useful uh, at the completion of the remodeling project. Uh, you are correct that the security items, many of them are exterior, uh, but they do include things like the steps uh, leading up to the Capitol. Uh, which are used by everyone, most everyone who comes to visit. Uh, so they are really important to the, uh, to the project, and uh, I believe it's worthy that they be included in this bill. Uh, next to your question about... Uh, could I, could I uh, Chairman, if I, if I may? Sure, I'm Representative Carlson. That, these, that that 30 million shouldn't be done at all. I was talking about the timing, whether these needed to be completed to occupy the building. And uh, you're saying that there may be some of that that uh, is needed. I'm, we can, the bill has to go to the House floor so we can check on what is totally exterior and what is needed for occupation. Um, my only point was that uh, the timing wasn't quite as critical if it was all exterior with the limited information that I had. But I 
we'll defer to getting more information between now and the House floor. So I just want to make it clear, I'm not arguing about doing these things at some point. It's how much of an emergency they are. Thank you, Representative Carlson and uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I did consult with uh, the administration about that same topic because I also believe that, for instance, the 6.2 million security could be delayed until next year. That would have been my preference. They assured me that the funding needed to be put in place now so that they could get the contracts in place so that they could meet the end date for the capital uh, project. They need to do the work while these folks are here on site and available. Uh, this is highly specialized work in many cases and that's uh, that was the message I got from them. You certainly are free to consult with them yourself and see if they tell you the same, give you the same information they gave to me. Representative Lincheski, then Erdahl and Mahoney. Sure, and I had that second part of the question about transparency. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I thought you were we done. Ended up okay. Talking about what was needed for the capital, and uh, there's All been right. rather broad support for the capital. I'm not arguing about supporting it. I was just talking about timing and one thing or another. But uh, okay, Representative Carlson. I did ask if the bill had been before the Capital Investment Committee voted on by the Capital Investment Committee. Uh, is this strictly the chairman's bill being presented for the first time? Uh, I just want to know a little bit of the uh, history here for transparency purposes. Uh, Chair Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Carlson, uh, it has not been voted on by the full committee. Uh, the, I didn't have a target until this morning. Uh, Representative Carlson, it's hard to assemble and, uh, and bring a bill to committee when you don't have a target. Uh, so that's uh, and many, some of the projects in here, not all, but many of the projects in here were heard before the committee, so they have information about them. Other projects like the Wilmer Poultry Testing Laboratory, I believe we have talked about on the House floor to a certain degree, and we all know the avian flu epidemic is something that has occurred in just the last couple of months. Uh, so that's, uh, I've already explained some of the logic behind some of these projects. Uh, many of them are not specific to any district. Uh, local road and bridge funds uh, go throughout the state, for instance. So um, I believe we've uh, done a pretty good job here. I know time is short. Uh, I wish I had more time to bring this all to the committee, but uh, we are at a rather late hour on the clock. Mr. Chair, Representative Carson. The I'll try to give, give you more time. We tried repeatedly to talk about the capital investment bill in here. And, uh, uh, I think we have an unfortunate situation relative to transparency when it does come together this late. And it was a concern of mine, at least, uh, all along, that uh, we should have been talking more about uh, capital investment than what we are here tonight. But uh, I'll stop there. I think you had other questions or comments. Representative Lincheski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Torkelson, Chair Torkelson. Did, can you tell me, did the governor help create this? Uh, Chair Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Lincheski, no. Okay. Representative Lincheski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, um, I guess just another question, and you know, I don't serve on your committee, so I don't know what's really happened there, but um, Representative Carlson was talking about how in the past there's been a caucus, you know, attempt to equal provisions out and you know there's been another way that past bonding chairs in both parties have structured bonding bills independent from the price tag and that is suburban metro rural and I heard the talk about the capital but you know I, I was trying to look through it and you know I hadn't seen it till it was here um, so you know I was just trying to do a rough calculation and my county, you know, one of 87 counties, has 23% of the state's population, and it contributes a significantly higher percent, higher percentage of all the taxes in the state than 23%. So it, you know, it, it pays a significantly higher chunk for the bonding bill for the whole state. And, and you know, I, I will say my constituents are happy to do that. I mean, when there's a flood problem or a need in greater Minnesota or northern Minnesota or southern Minnesota or downtown Minneapolis or a suburb or whatever, you know, we all do that together. But, you know, in just looking at this, other than a few tiny provisions, um, you know, I see 
very little spent in Hennepin County. And, and you know, the history around here has been that Hennepin County always gets the short end of the stick every time. It always gets the smallest percentage in the bonding bill, but it's usually not this short of a stick. And I'm wondering if you can help me, um, you know, this isn't, I think you know, Chair Tor Torkelson, this isn't a partisan comment. Uh, you know, my, our county is Representative Loons and Representative Andersons and Pepins and Pews and Hurtas and Smith and, you know, there's just a lot of us. I think there's 28 House members, Mr. Chair, hmm. of 134 who represent our county. And I'm, and I'm kind of missing, um, like I said, other than a few very tiny provisions, what the, the, the um, 1.2 million people who live in Hennepin County would get if this bill were to pass out of this bill. Chair Tarkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Ch thank you, uh, Representative Lincheski. I, I realize that this is an ongoing concern in bonding bills. Uh, different people interpret them in different ways as to how the fair how fair they are. Um, part of the issue here is this is a rather small bonding bill compared to many, and uh, I would say stay tuned. I will do my best to, in the future to. Uh, to uh, address those uh, regional concerns that are involved in any bonding bill. I would add that uh, my wife is in town today and uh, doing a little shopping. She's probably contributing via the, the shopping opportunities in your district. Uh, uh, Chair Lincheski, the more questions you ask him, the more his wife is likely to contribute. Uh, go ahead. You know, <laughs> except for, you know, I know people like to say that, but those receipts that happen at the Mall of America actually don't go to the city of Bloomington or to Hennepin County. They go to the state. And they buy all the projects in the state. So, so the bonding bill is where people often um, get, you know, some semblance of understanding that if they are, let's say, 23% of the population, they might get you know, some people would say they should get 23% of the money, and others would even say they should get a higher percentage than that because they're contributing significantly more than that. I have been, you know, I've understood it, and I've seen it in both parties, how it's more, you know, you know you're shooting for 10% or 15, but, you know, not one or two. Um, that, that gets really hard, for, I think, bipartisanly for all those legislators who represent the county to take a vote like this when it gets to the floor. Um, but. You know, as I've stated, uh, my my uh, constituents have understood that when we have problems in Minnesota, we need to fix them together. Um, but you know, they also don't want to be made a fool of. So um, there there needs to be a balance there. And and I, I I I guess I'll just stay tuned to learn more as this goes on. I I'm just speaking for one of the seven metro counties, and I think the other six could make a very similar argument. Um, but we you know we are the largest, so. I'm hoping as the negotiations continue, we'll see some regional balance in, in, the, in the bonding bill as it comes together. And I know Chair Torkelson has been very gracious to say he will eventually <coughs> come out and look at some projects in my district, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But I, I, you know, I, I will just tell people that I, I'm not really trying to play a game with it. Um, I have been a consistent yes vote for bonding bills. Um, almost the entire time I've been here, no matter you know which party put them together. Um, but I think this one has a problem that it's not only so small, it's so unbalanced that, and if the governor didn't even work on it, I, I think there's a number of things going on here that you know, we still have a few days and hopefully things will change. But I just wanted to you know, put that on the record. And again, I, I can't wait till you get to Southern Hennepin County to tour some projects. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Erdahl. Well, thank you. And uh, just responding a little bit, first of all, I think in, in the uh, in next year when we have the large bonding bill historically, I mean, that's, that's where I think we pay a lot more attention to balance. I mean, this is supposed to be about critical needs, and critical needs don't know geography. Uh, you know, the, the balance, I think, uh, you know, should be much more in tune next year. Now, in terms of, of needs, when we talk about the capital, uh, you know, we were told, I'm a member of the Capital Restoration Committee. Uh, we were told that these expenses needed to be done this year. And you know, talking about you know, the governor's input in this bill, well, I'll just correct uh, Representative Torkelson slightly in that the funds in this bill 
for the capital restoration were voted on by our capital restoration commission chaired by the governor who did vote for it. So therefore at least a portion of this bill that Representative Torkelson has was approved and voted on by the governor himself. Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and uh, I have some questions on the Minnesota Poultry Testing Lab in Wilmer. <laughs> um, I, I, I've just never heard of it. I mean, you said it was spoken to on the floor, and I don't remember hearing anything about it on the floor. So could you fill me in? I thought most of the testing was done at the U of M. Um, and I, I don't know if this is a you design, construct, furnish, and equip the expansion and renovation. So anything you can do to fill me in on it, I would appreciate it. Uh, Representative Thorkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Mahoney. Uh, the poultry testing lab in Wilmer is where uh, when birds are sick, they are sent for testing to verify what disease they have. Uh, the lab is, is older and needs renovation, uh, has been under uh, a very heavy use recently because of the avian flu outbreak um, and will continue probably because we think this avian flu is not going away. Uh, over the long run, we expect there may be reoccurrences here in Minnesota, and there's an ongoing need to test test these birds for disease, and uh, that happens in Wilmer. Uh, Representative Mahoney. I was under the impression most of the avian flu testing was done at the U. Um, I'm almost pretty sure of that one, but what I'd like to understand is, I mean, has this, where is it in Wilmer? I've been out there many times, and I've been to the Twin West campus and all the other places out there. Is it some, some hidden barn out in the back 40 someplace? Or, I mean, I, I've never heard of it. So I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out it's a $9 million investment. I'm not opposed to figuring out the avian flu. I, I think it's a, what we're going to have to do. Poultry is a huge issue here in the state. And, you know, we have a variety of problems with it. You don't have the veterinarians. Little dogs in, in suburbs, veterinarians make a whole lot more than farm veterinarians. So I, I do understand the, the, the problem you have out there with that. So anything more that you could tell me on that? Because again, I mean, I don't, how long has this lab been around? And is it this the first time we've ever uh, tried to fix this lab up? It took a crisis for us to actually start looking at how we're gonna serve greater Minnesota. Chair Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not know the history of the lab. Uh, I would like to remind you that these are both university facilities, both the facility here yeah. in St. Paul and this facility in Wilmer. Uh, this is a request of the University of Minnesota. It's one of their highest priorities. I'm responding to that request as to the exact location of the lab. Yeah, I, I've never been there, yeah. Representative Mahoney. If you and want to jump in the car with me someday and go down and see some sick turkeys, I'd be glad to take you along. I typically smoke cigars in my car, so you, we could drive separately, though. Unless you like cigars. Uh, perhaps we could take my motorcycle. No. <laughs> you could ride the <laughs> No. I don't do motorcycles. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Torkelson, um, under the Public Facilities Authority, usually, we usually have uh, state money to maximize the federal money. And we usually know the number of projects that will be qualified. And are we sticking to the projects by their rating. Uh, Chair Torkelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did not bring the PFA list with me. Uh, their request was for $20 million. We are shy of that request, so I'm confident that they do have the uh, appropriate matching funds in place, and these projects are ready to go. Uh, these are not, uh, you know, you know, I think you're familiar with their prioritization process. Uh, they will do as many projects as they have money for. Uh, they had requested, as I said, 20 million this score round. Uh, that would have gotten them all the way down the list as far as they felt they needed to go. This will be a little short of that, but it's at least a step, a pretty good sized step in the right direction. Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, is there any other way that we can make that other four million up? Uh, other than going back and reconsidering Representative Carlson's motion? Chair Torkelson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Murphy, uh, I suppose we could uh, swipe some money from something else, some other deserving project. Uh, but uh, as of now, my target is $100 million, and that's uh, what I have been given to work with. I would add, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Murphy, that uh, many of, I didn't bring the spreadsheet where I have that delineated, but many of these projects were part of the governor's uh, bonding bill. Uh, so when I say the governor was not involved, he was not involved with the selection of these projects, but the governor has and his staff have been involved with uh, apparently with vetting these projects because many of them were on the governor's uh, list of requested projects. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Murphy. I'm asking these questions because I feel that, you know, of all these things, that is, would be, if I had to prioritize, the Public Facilities Authority would be my first priority because I think it does the most good and it balanced across the state. And those projects are, um, you know, the cities and townships and um, counties that receive money from the Public Facilities Authority, usually through the loans or to grants. Um, are correcting definite groundwater problems and um, providing service to these communities. And it's balanced across the state. And it goes back to all our discussion that we've had tonight. And I really wish we could find that other four million. Seeing no further discussion, uh, Representative Carlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to encourage a uh, no vote. The uh, chair of the uh, Capital Investment Committee has implied that um, Maybe things could get better, um, but uh, he'll leave this committee with the low target, so it, he won't be able to make them better on the uh, House floor. Um, he mentioned just a moment ago that he had gotten, unfortunately, a low target. Uh, this is the committee that sets the targets for the House, and so that uh, could have been made better. Um, but. Uh, I just wanted to comment, you know, there's another form of balance and emergency. And by the way, we debated this about small bills, large bills, second year. There is a long history of a significant bill each and every year in recent years. I think that remains, at least in my view, a bit of a, a myth that, that you don't do a large bonding bill. Uh, and I think I shared with the committee earlier in the session uh, what the history uh, had been in the last decade or more. Um, but uh, we did have a conversation about uh, balance. Um, Representative Lincheski made some good points, and uh, one thing that's very lacking here, and usually about 30% of a bonding bill, regardless of size, maybe 40% in many years, is uh, higher education. And when we talk about emergency kinds of things, I know both systems had HEPA requests. Speaking of spending, things that spread around the state, that's one thing that happens with uh, HEPR. Uh, for those in the audience who may not know what I'm referring to, most places might refer to that as repair and betterment. But uh, if you have a leaky roof, you better fix it this year rather than next year. Uh, if you have tuck pointing issues, you better fix it uh, this year rather than next year. Um, so there are a lot of uh, issues uh, in other parts of state government. I'm just using uh, higher education as one example. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you represent a uh, really a major center of education, a tech college, uh, uh, state university. I think we even have a DNR facility there, if I recall, in St. Cloud. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, facilities around the state that uh, need that uh, appropriation to keep up on the repairs. Otherwise, they simply cost you more in the future. And there's not a single uh, item on the list here that uh, would provide anything for, uh, for higher education. Um, I'm not one that has one uh, an institution in my community, uh, but I certainly am very interested in them because I provide students to probably virtually every uh, uh, higher education uh, system in the state of Minnesota, you know, from my from my area. Um, I shouldn't say I provide them, my community provides them. But uh, I would encourage a, a no vote. We could have a better bill. And uh, 
if it's successful in moving out of committee at this point you simply need a majority vote you do need 81 on the uh, house floor and i think you're going to have some tough sledding the way this bill is laid out to get to 81. representative torkelson uh, mr chair i don't have the sheet with me that, that delineates the what was passed in the first year of the past biennium but I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe there was no heaper in uh, your party's bill in the first year of the last biennium. I, I wouldn't swear to that without getting the sheet in front of me, but I know it was mostly uh, the capital renovation project and some limited disaster relief, if I remember correct. So this is not unprecedented. Representative Carlson, uh, your party did much the same thing. Mm -hmm. well, oh, Mr. Chairman, one Representative of the Carlson. It's sometimes asked, and I spent many years on the Capital Investment Committee and Appropriations before we had one. Uh, uh, the question would have to be what the request was from, in the case of the systems and so on, for Keeper that particular year. I, year I would have to look at the uh, at the bill, but I do know mm -hmm. that most systems were requesting Keeper this year. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Carlson. I would be surprised if their request was zero and I think you would be too. I would have to take a look I'm not denying that one way or the Thank other but sure. I'm just saying that I don't recall what whether they had a request or not see no further discussion representative Torkelson renews like a roll call. oh re okay renews his motion that house file 622 as amended be referred to the general register uh, the clerk will take the roll on the bill Yes. Albright. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Carlson. No. Cornish. Yes. David. Yes. Dean. Detmer. Yes. Dreskowski. Aye. Garofalo. Yes. Gunther. Yes. Hackberg. Yes. Hil Hamilton. Yes. Hillstrom. No. Hornstein. Kahn. Mancheski. No. Liebling. No. Loon. Mahoney. No. McNamara. Yes. Murphy. No. Nornis. Pulowski. No. Poppy. No. Torkelson. Yes. Erdahl. Yes. Wagenius. There being 14 ayes and 9 nays, uh, House File 622, as amended, is referred to the General Register. All right, the uh, final item that we have, and thank you for your patience, Representative O'Driscoll, is uh, Senate File 1398. And uh, while... Uh, and we do have, has that amendment uh, to Senate File 1398 been passed out, Mr. Stone, do you know? Yeah. Okay, we've got an amendment to uh, pass out to it. Uh, while that's uh, going on, uh, the chair will move that Senate File 1398 be referred to the General Register. And um, maybe while the amendment's being uh, passed out, Representative O'Driscoll, uh, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, I don't think you've uh, been before us before. Maybe you can describe Senate File 1398. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, this is uh, the amendment that we're considering this evening is going to be to the, to the uh, 2015 Omnibus Pension Bill. And uh, there's, as um, folks uh, who are on this committee know and are veterans to the legislature, um, the Pension Commission is put in place to help oversee and to make recommendations to the uh, legislature at large about pension corrections, pension related issues. And one of the things that, um, in addition to many of the standard things that we would see, technical language cleanup, constituent related issues, this year we were looking at the issue of MRF, the Minneapolis Employer Retirement Fund. A number of years ago, those being 2009, the uh, MRF was put under the administration of the PERA folks and they were going to continue to administer that until such time that it received an 80% funding level. And at that time, it would be merged into PERA. 
This year we have received that 80% uh, funding level through a number of things, market returns being one, and contributions by employers and the state of Minnesota to help stabilize those benefits for retirees. What we found out as a result of the merger of MRF into PERA, an actuarial review was done that said that the combined $51 million that had previously been paid and split between the state of Minnesota paying $24 million per year and the city of Minneapolis paying $27 million plus approximately $4 million more for administrative costs for a total of $31 million was no longer needed. PERA had an actuarial evaluation done and the number was determined to be $37 million would be a more appropriate going forward number. As the Pension Commission doing its due diligence had asked its independent actuary to review the results from the PERA evaluation and they also concurred with the methodology that was used on that particular evaluation of being $37 million. And so what had happened in the um, Pension Commission is Representative Thiessen had offered, who's a member of the Commission, had offered a, an amendment that would have brought that split down for the City of Minneapolis to $21 million and the state of Minnesota to 16 million. In the House state government finance bill, that 37 million was looked to be split 31 for the city of Minneapolis, in essence keeping them at the same contribution level for the next two years as they had been for the previous years prior to the merger. And that that number would, would reduce to six million for the next two years for the, uh, the state of Minnesota. What had happened is we had amended this bill in the State Government Finance Committee to do that $31 million, $6 million split. As a part of the agreement that was reached for the State Government Finance Bill, the $31 million and $6 million are to be used for the uh, next fiscal year for the numbers splits between the City of Minneapolis at all employers and the State of Minnesota. And then for the remaining years, we would refer to the um, split that was offered by the Thiessen Amendment during the Pension Commission, which would be that $16 million for the state of Minnesota and $21 million. Both parties would be experiencing some savings. The savings would be at uh, different amounts and different levels for the, the participants, simply depending upon where they are in that spectrum. And so, Mr. Chair, we're looking to be able to amend the pension bill and uh, to move forward with that language. So again, in summary, what we would be looking at is doing a modification for the next two years, for the, the upcoming biennium that we're working on, to a $31 million split to the city of Minneapolis, $6 million split to the state of Minnesota, and then moving forward with the Pension Commission's recommendations for the remainder of the uh, anticipated investment needed to be able to continue to pay the benefits to the MRF employees. Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, well, members, we have the A2 amendment in front of us, and I think that Representative O'Driscoll has described, in addition to some of the items in uh, Senate File 1398, what was in the A2 amendment. So I'll formally move the A2 amendment. And just do have a question, Representative O'Driscoll. Uh, is it my understanding, do you say that the uh, ongoing funds for future years, uh, that that is something that uh, the Pension Commission uh, supported uh, and that was authored by Representative Thiessen? Mr. Chair, yes. What had happened was we were looking at this information laid on in our work in the Pension Commission and the MRF actual evaluation was done and Representative Thiessen did offer an amendment that would take the revised number of $37 million that PERA anticipated that they would need and put that at a split of $16 million for the state of Minnesota and $21 million for the uh, city of Minneapolis at all employers and on a voice vote that passed unanimously, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Is there discussion to the A2 amendment? Representative Murphy. Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, you keep saying the city of Minneapolis, but there's more than the city of Minneapolis. Am I correct? In, uh, Representative employers? Mr. Chair, that's why I refer to it as the city of Minneapolis at all employers because it would include also the MAC, some school district, uh, and other residual employers um, when the fund was closed. And then those new employees were moved to the PERA program. And, Representative Murphy. And Mr. Chair, when um, that happened, there was a proportional share 
uh, was there not, with the employers and um, based on the number of workers that had been covered by the, uh, the MRF participants that had been covered by these various employers? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Murphy, you are correct. That um, split was never a part of the statute that was worked out between the City of Minneapolis and those other employing entities. And in essence, a check was delivered to PERA for the amount that was necessary under state law to be able to meet that. Well, what happened under the proposed 31 million is those employers who would be paying that 27 would still pay that and the um, administrative costs that the City of Minneapolis would be paying would be added into that 31. Still the same amount that is being paid by the City of Minneapolis and the other employing entities and the administrative costs. Um, I would not want to speak for the City of Minneapolis and those other employing entities if they have negotiated something different or what have you, because that's outside of the scope of what the Pension Commission is looking at. The Pension Commission and PERA want to just ensure that the dollars are, that are needed are collected and paid. That other decision has been left to the employers as to the split. Okay. And Representative Murphy. Ms. Mr. Chairman, Representative O'Driscoll, then proportionately, will this change the amounts of money uh, you, to get that, to keep that 31 million uh, or the amount of money that the employers are paying? Um, will that ch proportionally will that change the uh, amounts of money that the various employers might have to contribute? Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, um, Representative Murphy, to your to your question, the 31 million really represents the 27 that's already paid plus the four that Minneapolis pays. So my assumption would be that the city of Minneapolis would still be paying the four million dollars for the administrative cost, and then the other 27 would be prorated back to the employers like it is right now. However, again, I'm not going to speak for the city of Minneapolis and how they work with the other employing entities to come up with that $27 million. The $27 million. Um, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, one thing I've, I've learned through this process and my new assignment this year of being the lead on the uh, K early, early 12 education fund uh, comes from the lessons that Ms. Kelleher has told me about uh, the school boards uh, association that um, <coughs> pension monies have to come out of usually the formula or the per pupil unit money that the school districts get from the state. And one of my questions in this clarification of how this happened between and it happened after it left the Pensions Committee, and this is my first chance to ask these questions. But will the school children have to pay more money because of this reapportionment of the employer's amount to the MRF? Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, thank you. Representative Murphy, um, like yourself, I had also been visited by Ms. Kelleher having the same kinds of questions and concerns. And those are very um, founded concerns. This pension group with the MRF folks who are being merged in um, is a closed fund. It means that every day that goes by, there are fewer people who are paying into that fund. And the PERA and the uh, principles that are observed generally by the Pension Commission are concerned about um, not having one group or one employing group, be it a city group, a county group, a school district group, subsidizing or paying more or paying less than their fair share. What PERA has told us is that they have a method in which to track the um, 3,800 plus or minus individuals that are in here to determine the amount of benefits that are being paid out based on the dollars that are coming in and the return and that they would, would keep the Pension Commission advised as to whether one of three things is happening. It's still good, the numbers are working. Number two, maybe we're getting better returns and we don't need as much so that number could be adjusted. And the third would be it's falling short and advise the Pension Commission of a formula or and or dollar change that would be necessary. It is not the intention of the Pension Commission or my intentions that the PERA general fund would in any way sub, uh, subsidize, nor would I expect the, P, the MRF folks to pay more 
or less than what would be owed for that particular group. And Representative Murphy. M Mr. Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, how long is this amendment then um, addresses the global agreement and we're going to go back to the way of paying the amount of money in two years, or, right? Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, I was just going to ask if Representative Murphy could restate the question. I wasn't we're going back, sure. Mr. Chair. Representative Murphy. We're going back to the proposal as it left the Pension Commission. Mr. Chair. Representative O'Driscoll. That is correct. The, uh, in the timeline that was looked at and anticipated to reach full vesting on this, the first two years of that timeline would be the exception to the rule of what the Pension Commission did. The remaining years would be the recommendations from the Pension Commission, which were found in the Thiessen Amendment. Okay. And Representative Murphy. And Mr. Chair, Representative O'Driscoll, do you think that the people that are receiving benefits from MRF or the new people that will become beneficiaries of MRF, will they ever be able to qualify for a cost of living increase? Representative Logistical. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, um, I would like to ask that the policy director from PERA come down and uh, share in the discussion as well. Uh, Ms. Shana Jones is here, uh, Shana Jones, excuse me, is here, and she can speak to, to, the, uh, to the question that Representative Murphy has, uh, has raised. All right, Ms. Jones and Ms. would uh, come forward. Uh, and, Representative Murphy. And Mr. Chair, as she's coming forward, Representative O'Driscoll, when do you feel that um, the MRF people will be completely merged? Representative O'Driscoll. Mr. Chair, I think that's also a very good question for the policy director from, from PERA, Ms. Jones, to um, and she can come to the testifying table if that's the wishes of the chair sure. to answer both of those questions because those are more the administrative in charges of the, uh, the folks over at PERA. Uh, Ms. Jones, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Chair, member Shana Jones, policy director of PERA. And if I may, I'd like to ask Representative Murphy to ask the question just once more. I was back a little bit. Okay. Um, Representative Mahone, M Murphy. The, the, Mr. Chair, oh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Jones, my first question was, when do you anticipate or do you ever anticipate that the people that are member, members of the MRF, will they ever qualify? for a benefit or a cost of living benefit. Ms. Jones. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, we have assumptions that predict what it, the future holds. And when we assume an 8.5% rate of return, which we are changing this year, we assume that we'll start paying an, uh, an adjustment for our entire plan because they're now part of our larger general plan on a date specific. That's not necessarily representative of reality, but rather the assumption today. So if we lower that rate of return assumption to eight, it now takes us longer in our assumptions to reach a full funding level where that cost of living adjustment would be produced. So um, again, do we anticipate that they'll receive a cost of living adjustment? Yes, we do. Um, we anticipate that it's approximately 10 years later because of our lowering of the assumption. But again, that's an assumption and reality will prevail. So in our valuation that's done every fiscal year, we look at what the last year of reality has done and we reset and continue to project. So um, we project that they will get an increase, but again, reality will prevail. And when we hit 90% funded, the entire general plan will experience an increase in their cost of living adjustment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, Ms. Ms. Jones. Then when do you anticipate that the mer full merger will have taken place? Ms. Jones. 
Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, the full merger actually took place January 1st of 2015. The statutes that were drafted and codified in, um, into law in 2010 required that we do cleanup language a little after the fact, which is what we're doing now, but they officially merged and are now the former MRF members as of January 1st. Okay. And Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, the actuarial assumptions that we talked about and with the 8% that we're going down to as a recommendation of the Pension Commission, um, how long will that take place? Ms. Jones. What, what is the assumption near that we will be good? Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, in the actuary's projections for our general plan, which is what uh, will really prevail for all members that are in that plan, including former MRF members, Assuming an 8.5% rate of return going forward, we would pay out a 2.5% cost of living adjustment in 2027. Assuming an 8% rate of return going forward, that would be 2037. And again, that's, that's um, representative for our entire plan. And the caveat is that the actuary did that using the GASB uh, rate of return assumption, which is 7.9. So it's a, it's a rough date. So Ms. Ms. Representative Chair, Ms. Murphy. Jones. So 2037 with the 8.8%. .8%. Ms. Jones. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, that is our general plan, our big plan that they're now part of. And Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, Ms. Ms. Jones, um, the people that are, were in the general plan in December and the people that are all in the general plan today, the people that are in the, the new people that came into the general plan through that had been MRF, but now they're fully qualified and paid for. The people that were in the general plan are not subsidizing in any way the MRF people. Am I correct? Uh, Ms. Jones. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, you are correct. That's what the $37 million uh, total contribution for the unfunded liabilities attributable to the former MRF division ensures. And so the Representative plan, Murphy. Ms. Chair, Ms. Jones, so the plan is on track and is not being driven off track by anything that is in the amendment or in the uh, bill that is before us that was recommended by the um, Pension Commission, the Government Operations Committee, and Ms. the State Government Finance Committee. Ms. Jones. Mr. Chair, Representative Murphy, as long as we have $37 million per year until 2031, we will continue to ensure that we're on track as we intended to be in our with the, pl the plan in its entirety, including the former MRF members. Okay. And this amendment um, provides 37 million per year. Um, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, for further clarification um, point, I just wanted to clarify that at the pen on the Pension Commission, I thought it was a better idea than to stop at the 37 million. Um, I thought it was better to continue um, with a larger amount, preferably the 51 million, was it 51 million? Um, and I spoke to that, but surprisingly, I lost. And I haven't forgotten it, but I've let it go. Don't hold the grudge. But I thought we needed more money to continue in to really be sure that we were stabilizing the plan and so that the recipients of either the general the the total general PERA now would have no idea that their their benefits were being threatened because of this merger uh, representative O'Driscoll said that um, at the State Government Finance Committee that um, what has been promised is, will continue to be promised, and the state is always 
made good on their promises. And um, Ms. Jones now in her answers has told us that um, the plan is with the 37 million that um, we will be able to become fully funded, even though we're going from eight and a half assumption down to eight assumption. And uh, that's what this is all about. I just want to say one more time that the people that are, as far as I understand it, that everybody's benefits will continue. It might take a longer time for cost of living increases to come by. Um, but as best as we can tell, those of us that heard uh, in the Pension Commission, um, we should be stable. Is there any other discussion to the A2 amendment? See no discussion. All in favor of the A2 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion prevails. The A2 amendment is adopted. Mr. Chair, members, thank you. Uh, Remember, we have the bill before us as amended, Senate File 1398. I have a uh, discussion to the bill, Representative Lincheski. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, I'm glad Chair Draskowski is still here because I want to ask uh, about a tax provision that's in this bill and why it didn't go to taxes. And for members who might want to look, and for Chair Draskowski, because this tax account is in his division of the tax committee, it's Article 6 of the bill, page 53. And you know, I think it's probably a good idea, but it's permanent spending in a tax area that never this bill never went to the tax committee. And you know, I'm not sure if people want to provide the Senate with a tax vehicle, but maybe that's what the plan is here, so they can uh, send some over your way, and you'll have to deal with that. But um, Article Six is, as members can see on line 53.13, um, what's happening here is it's making the uh, pension aid that again is in Chair Draskowski and has been that account has been in the tax committee the entire time I've been here and it's been in, it's in his committee and so it's a permanent spending for um, the you know police and firefighter pension aids and so for members who aren't familiar with this in taxes um, we often say in taxes there are legislators who will say you know I don't get local government aid or I don't get fill in the blank I don't get anything, and every district gets this pension aid. It's a tax item, and it's being carried in the pension bill. I don't know why I checked, and I understand that even the nonpartisan pension staff testified the bill would need to go to taxes if this stayed in there. Um, that was Larry Martin had stated that on the record during the hearing. And then I also got the accounts here that you, you Chair Knobloch, put together for the year, and and you know I know Mr. Marks probably has them too, but. Unless they were amended, the account um, for the aids and credits for these pension aids are in the purview of the tax committee and, and have been the entire time I've been here, as I've said. So, you know, maybe Chair Draskowski, I know Chair Davids was here, he's, not, he's now gone, or, um, uh, you know, the author or Chair Knobloch can tell me what's going on here now, why we have a tax provision here. Or are we going to move to send this bill to taxes, and is that going to meet tonight? I did just see the email that the speaker has now said we're not on the floor till midnight, um, and I know rules um, or hearing notices of meetings have been waived, so the tax committee could certainly meet next. But I just want to understand what's going on here. Well, I, I just, I don't know if uh, any of the other members that were referenced uh, want to comment on it. Otherwise, I guess I would just say I, I don't know under the rules, Representative Lincheski, I guess I'd have to consult them on whether, I mean, yeah. this is an item that is carried in the tax committee, but I don't know that it is a tax provision in the sense of a income tax or sales tax or something like that. Um, I guess I I would... Defer, obviously, to any of the other members that have more uh, well, experience with that. And Representative Lincheski, uh, you're one of them. But I guess to me, I mean, this is a pension bill, and this is an article about pensions, and it would seem to be appropriate that it be in the pension bill. And I don't know that that necessarily means it 
has to go to the tax committee because I don't know that there are any particular tax implications to it that are any different than any other uh, pension items. Uh, but Representative Lincheski, well, perhaps you can enlighten me. Well, Mr. Chair, you know, and, and if you look at the chapter of law, you know, 423, that's the tax area. And for people who doubt that these aids aren't tax items, I mean, so what the local pension, I don't have the list in front of me, but the aids that Chair Draskowski is in charge of are things like border cities aid, disparity aid, local government aid, fiscal disparities, county program aid. These are the purview of his committee. Um, decisions made in these aids are uh, solely belong in the tax committee. So if people now want to make an argument that that's not the case, I encourage you to get the statute book out and take a look. Um, you know, you, Mr. Chair, you have the authority, I guess, to do whatever you want. Um, tax amendments, of course, will be germane to this bill. And, of course, if it gets sent over to the Senate, you have a different issue. Uh, that's, that's your majority's issue. I think Senator Bach <laughs> would be very happy for you to do that for him so that uh, he has a, 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 an ability to send you a file back um, before adjournment. But, you know, I, I think there is... I can't see any argument that this could possibly not be anything other than what I've stated. Um, had it gone to taxes, I think it's just fine. So, you know, transportation taxes and, and health care taxes and all the taxes that people have looked at this year, um, you know, the tax chair gets to decide. You can either send the bill through taxes and Chair Davids can pull the provisions out and carry them in the tax bill like he did to Chair Dean. He removed the premium tax credit for the HHS bill and he carried it in the tax bill. He removed the provider tax that was in the HHS bill and he carried it in the tax bill. Or he could have sent that bill out with him and then after the tax committee having heard it. Similarly, in the education bill, um, many of the tax provisions were removed and carried in the tax bill. Um, in, the, in the transportation bill, all kinds of provisions were removed and carried in the tax bill. Now we have a tax provision sitting in a pension bill. And I think the easy solution is to have the tax committee meet tonight or tomorrow and hear the provision and let Chair Draskowski and Chair Davids think through if they believe that this should happen. I mean, it's not a thing that doesn't cost money. It's, it's like you know, one way to think about it. So let's say we're appropriating local government aid to the tune of $507 million a year and you're putting in law, we're going to do that for all time. I mean, there, there's a cost to that. And, um, you know, I mean, you have the authority, Mr. Chair, to do whatever you want. Um, but. I think you should expect some loud protest as we get to the floor. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I do thank you for bringing it to our attention, Representative Lomachewski. I, I don't think that we are in any danger of the uh, Senate uh, firing something back at us since this is, in fact, a Senate file. So uh, all that can uh, happen is uh, for us to send it to them and for them to either uh, pass it on to the governor or uh, refuse to concur. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, Chair Draskowski, do you have any uh, thing you want to say on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't remember a uh, hearing request coming for this particular um, uh, provision, and in um, learning what I can about it at this point, uh, it appears, and I talked to staff, that uh, this doesn't do anything to um, change tax rates or uh, in any way uh, change. Uh, tax policy. There's some restructuring of accounts uh, on lines 53.5 and 6. Um, but other than that, I don't see any reason, Mr. Chair, that this would have to come through the tax area for a decision. Um, it is a tax. It is a an item that's uh, uh, that that is in a, a tax area of statutes. But it's not something that. Yeah. I, Anyway, that's uh, that's all I can offer, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Chair, while you're reading the uh, rules. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to be fair, Representative Lincheski. Uh, Representative Lincheski, go ahead. Well, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, I, again, you can do whatever you want. And the rules, as, as since you've got them in your hand, I'm not looking at them. I don't have mine. But, it, but, you know, I will remind members that whether something goes to taxes or not is not if there's a rate change, as Chair Draskowski just said, or if a tax goes up or down. If there's a change to tax policy that doesn't cost a nickel, still goes to tax committee. And, and in fact, this actually does cost a nickel. So let, let, me give you the, let me give you a tax corollary. So in the omnibus tax bill that the House carried this year, there was a provision to give all Minnesotans 
who are in the income tax system a increased personal exemption deduction. I think that provision alone costs, Chair Draskowski can help me, I, I want to say $400 million. Um, we, we offered an amendment on the House floor as a minority to not make that a two-year tax cut for everybody, but to make it permanent. Now, part of the reason that didn't pass is because it would permanently require the state of Minnesota to do that, and that's exactly what this provision is doing. <coughs> it is permanently requiring a tax aid to be paid for for all time. Read it on the line. It says 53.13 does not terminate. So, you know, if, if you want to say it doesn't cost money, it does, but even if you buy that, um, that isn't the measure for where, whether bills go to tax committee. And, you know, I've said enough. I think I know that you're probably not sent in this tax committee, but um, yeah, I just think this is the kind of stuff that happens when, you know, we're meeting this late. The tax committee does have time to hear this. Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to Representative Lancheski, if you take a look at page 53, it uh, speaks to 356.215, which is actuarial valuation experience rating. Uh, and if you take a look back at uh, 49.13 through 49.14, what you're really doing is saying that in the light of an actuar actuarial valuation that is insufficient, uh, the actuary may suggest uh, a, a redetermination of the amounts that are contributed either by the employer or employee. Uh, Representative Lonchesky. Mr. Chair, I mean, Please. there's no point to belaboring it. I know people have other things to do, and and I I hear you, uh, Representative Albright. I mean, I think that's you know, I know I've had to do it before, make the arguments. But members on line, you know, 53.3, we are amending a tax code, and what we're doing in chat in section 423 is a tax provision that is in Chair Draskowski and Chair David's committees, and we are permanently. In providing an aid that was never heard in the tax committee and again I understand what's going to happen here but um, I will continue to protest it thank you mr. Chair. Um, Re representative Carlson yeah, mr. chairman I don't know if others have questions but uh, uh, I thought uh, after the amendment went on it might be uh, good to just very briefly hear from uh, Probably Mr. Johnson and uh, Mr. Ranieri, if they're still here, as to what their thoughts are about the bill um, yeah. after it's been amended. We, uh, we already adopted it. I know we adopted it. Oh. No, it's on the bill. Yes. And I want to know what their thoughts are as the bill is about to uh, move forward, if uh, how they perceive the bill as amended. Maybe I should correct how I say that, but no, the bill I, has I, amended. I if they have any thoughts very quickly, because uh, they did have concerns, Mr. Chairman, uh, when we were in state government finance. So well, certainly happy to have them come forward and testify. If you've got some questions for them, Representative Carlson could, um, uh, the gentleman that were referenced, Mr. Ranieri, um, come <coughs> forward. Mr. Ranieri, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Mr. Chairman, Chairman thank I'm you very much. asking for extensive uh, testimony, but the bill was amended, and uh, there's that two-year window now that was put in, and then it reverts back. And so uh, uh, I think it's important for us to, to know what the city of Minneapolis, and I don't know if Mr. Johnson is still here, but he represents, I think, Murph. Uh, so uh, at least uh, you're here if you could comment. Mr. Chairman and Mr. members. Ranieri. Gene Ranieri from the City of Minneapolis. I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Relations. Uh, the, starting in 2017, uh, the split between the state and the employers, which include Hennepin County, ourselves, the school board, the park board, and MAC, uh, it would be 2116, which was the same as the Pension Commission adopted a few months ago. So we're okay with that. So you're okay with the bill as it Yes. Is. Okay, and I'd like to hear from Mr. Johnson. I see he's entered uh, the room, if he would be willing to. Uh, Representative Murphy, did you have a question for Mr. Ranieri? I do. Uh, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, Mr. Ranieri, um, can we go back to the proportional amount? Is that, could you address that at all? Mr. Will Ranieri. Will that change at all for? You mean a month? 
Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Murphy, you mean between and among the each? Mm -hmm. It will not change. Uh, uh, off the top of my head, the city of Minneapolis is 56 percent of the contribution. The park board is 10 percent. The school board is 23 percent, and MAC is around 5 percent, and the rest I think is the county. And that will not stay the same. That will stay the same. It will not change. Because I think, Mr. Chair, and I'll check, uh, Representative Murphy, I think the split is uh, identified in statute. I think it's a proportion of what the liabilities were back in 2009 per, per uh, employer. Okay, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Johnson. Hi. Mr. Johnson, welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we as you know, uh, at least uh, several of us in, on uh, a previous committee, uh, uh, quite frankly, voted no on the bill because we were concerned at the time about uh, the provision involving MRF. Mm -hmm. And now that's been amended, and mm -hmm. uh, we were interested yeah. in what uh, you and Mr. Ranieri had to say right. about the bill as it's now amended. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the community, my name is Dave Johnson. I represent the Minneapolis Municipal Retirement Association. Um, you know, throughout the process, we have raised a concern uh, about the assumptions that the actuary used to reach the $37 million figure, specifically the discount rate, uh, and that was based on a statement made by the actuary. Um, <coughs> You know, I've been around here in one form or another since 1986, and I know when that ship has sailed, and that ship sailed. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I have spoken with uh, Representative O'Driscoll, uh, you know, and others, and, you know, my understanding is the Pension Commission um, is going to continue to look at that issue, so that makes us feel better about things. Uh, you know, and, and our just our basic concerns, we want it to be the right number. You know, we don't want your members in Paris subsidizing um, the MRF uh, merger, you know, there's the perception in the Minneapolis teachers merger where that's happened, even though there wasn't a subsidy there, so that was important to us, but then also to make sure that we paid our way. So, um, you know, we feel uh, like progress has been made uh, on the split, and we feel good about that, and we feel better about, you know, continuing to look at the issue, but, but that's our concern, and it's really, you know, um, trying to get the best number, not the one that is, you know, not unreasonable from an actuarial perspective, but the one that best hits, you know, the best educated guess we can make to get there. So um, we'll continue working on it and go from there. But thank you for the opportunity. Representative Carlson, do you have any other questions? No, I, that, All right. Uh, being that uh, we did quite frankly, rather strongly, uh, to say the least, oppose the bill and state government finance because of the MRF provision. Uh, uh, thought it was important that we find out what the feelings were of uh, the MRF representative and the city of Minneapolis. So I thank them both. Okay, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, I have a question for Representative O'Driscoll. Representative O'Driscoll. Um, What's the path forward now for this bill? Is it going to continue to be a bill? Uh, Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Murphy, um, the motion that the chair made tonight, assuming that it um, makes it through the Ways and Means Committee, will be to be referred to the General Register, which means that it would be able to come up on the floor um, for a vote. And the Senate has passed a similar version um, earlier this week, 53 to 11 in consultation with the vice chair, who is Senator Pappas. She and I have been in very close contact with one another throughout the last seven days about the provisions, making sure that they line up. She um, has some housekeeping language that is in their bill that we have incorporated along the way in ours, and she is open to taking this on a concurrence if we pass it and send it over to the Senate, so it would be then able to go to the governor to take care of um, the, uh, the technical corrections and all the other issues that we spoke about this evening, along with constituent uh, related activities. Ms. Uh, Ms. Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, um, Representative O'Driscoll, will any parts of, to your knowledge, will any parts of this bill be also included in the state government finance bill? 
Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Murphy, the only thing that would be referenced to the best of my knowledge in the state government finance bill would be the, uh, because it is a finance committee and we referenced the uh, split that we put in this evening would be the biennial number for the, for the uh, state government finance bill of the $31 million, $6 million split and there would be no other language that would be pension related language in that um, bill other than it would need to be supporting that $31 million, $6 million split. And Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, is the savings from the difference between the 37 million and the 51 million, is that um, that's completely separated from pension money at this time? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Murphy, um, because the state government finance um, uh, area had a, a complete target, and this is savings that's being recognized under that particular financial uh, umbrella. Those monies were used in, in other ways in the uh, state pension, excuse me, in the uh, state government finance bill. Any other discussion to Senate File 1398 as amended? Well, members, I guess I'm not sure what to say in regard to the other uh, tax issue that was uh, brought up before. I, I guess it, you know, when I read the rule, it talks about a bill with a substantial impact on tax revenues or tax policies. This certainly doesn't have an impact on tax revenues. It certainly has an impact on pension policies. That particular item is carried in the tax bill. But I guess, you know, I think what I would do as chair is to just uh, renew my motion with the idea that uh, we can deal it with it on the floor if uh, people feel that this is something that uh, should be referred. So I'll uh, renew my motion that Senate File 1398, as amended, be referred to the General Register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion prevails. Senate File 1398, as amended, is referred to the General Register. Mr. Chair and members, thank you. Thank you, Representative O'Driscoll. Uh, well, members, before I had told you I thought we had our last meeting last time, I think this is our last meeting this time. Um, I was thinking, Representative Carlson, you know, I can recall uh, going back to one of your uh, previous uh, comments that I know of at least one amendment I can think of that we had of yours uh, with a campaign finance board that uh, we we took a while back. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate your um, very minor, Mr. Chairman, one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. But I appreciate well, your uh, leadership and help, and Representative and I have Carlson. One hundred fifty thousand looks a little different uh, when you're in a committee like this, but uh, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. All right. Well. Members, uh, I uh, don't know if this is the last meeting or not, but anyway, thank you so much uh, for all your help. Thank you, staff, Representative Carlson. Well, I just, uh, last time uh, you thanked uh, Shirley uh, for uh, all these uh, good treats. She had them here again tonight, and I didn't get an opportunity to uh, thank her as well. I've almost thanked her daily, but uh, uh, well, we really appreciate that and just wanted to know that. Thank you. Well, she deserves daily thanks and I will have to get on to a major exercise program here as soon as the session is over. <laughs> With that, members, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>